Welcome to Recollections, the Middle Tennessee Voices of Their Time series. A look at the past through the experiences of Middle Tennesseans. This is Bob Bullen along with Bob Womack of Middle Tennessee State University with our guest, four-star general and retired Marine Corps Commandant Leonard Fielding Chapman, Jr. and his wife, Emily. And in part one of our conversation, we talked about their early career and marriage and life in World War II. So now I believe we'll take up with a, an event that put a sudden end to World War II, the atomic bomb. And General, what was your reaction when you heard about the <coughs> atomic bomb? Well, of course, it was a complete surprise to us. Uh, you know, the atomic uh, effort, the Manhattan Project had been kept totally secret. So uh, our first reaction was to, was to wonder what kind of uh, weapon it was, uh, how it worked. And then we got, began to get reports on its magnitude, on the devastation that it wrought in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And that was immediately followed by the call of the emperor for uh, peace. He said his people had suffered enough. And they certainly had suffered, not only in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but in Tokyo, and uh, which had been completely burned out, and there are tremendous losses overseas. So uh, very shortly thereafter, uh, peace was declared uh, on uh, the end of the war was declared, J Japan conditionally, unconditionally surrendered, and it was the, the immediate cause of the surrender was the two atomic bombs. So, of course, those of us that, uh, well, all of us, and particularly those of us that were in the invasion force that was to land in Japan just a few weeks later and fight our way through the main Japanese islands against the entire Japanese population, we were more than delighted. We were really relieved. That was one landing that uh, we weren't looking forward to. <laughs> so you have definite opinions about the use of the bomb. Oh, I think it was essential. It, it brought the war to an immediate end. Otherwise, we'd have had the, the Japanese would not have surrendered. We'd have had to land on the island of Honshu in accordance with our plan. It was, the operation was called Olympic. Um, it was an invasion force of, uh, up, would have been, in the end, up to a million men against uh, many millions of Japanese, and the casualties would have been unthinkable. We probably would have lost a half a million Marines and soldiers. Uh, the Japanese would have lost uncounted millions of men, women, and children. What was it like at home, the news of the <laughs> war ending? Oh, there was great, great jubilation. We went downtown and rode in a parade, and they were throwing uh, confetti around. It was very exciting. Mm -hmm. We talked about in part one that you really didn't know where your husband was because of the censorship and, yes. and whatever. Toward the end, did you have any better notion of what was going on? Didn't know where he was, no, except that he would be with the Peace Forces. Mm -hmm. well, how long was your separation there? Well, we were separated two years during two World War II. Mm -hmm. Well, tell me about that homecoming. I must have been mm -hmm. well, to yeah, finally see each other again. Event. I was ordered from the 1st Marine Division back to the Marine headquarters at Pearl Harbor, Fleet Marine Force Pacific, and I was there a few months after the end of the war. I was the staff secretary. And every morning, all the incoming traffic from the night before passed across my desk, and I'd go through them quickly, just knowing that I'd eventually come to one that said, order Lieutenant Colonel Chapman back to the <laughs> <laughs> United States. And sure enough, one morning, there it was. And I carried it with a certain pride into the chief of staff, who was my immediate boss, General Silverthorne. And I said, here it is, General. I'm coming to say goodbye. And he said, well, all right, you deserve it. Go on back. <laughs> so I did. I went on back. I met Emily right here in, in uh, Nashville, Glen Echo. And uh, we were here a little while, and then we went to our next duty station, which was uh, Headquarters Marine Corps in Washington, D.C., where I was executive officer of the Division of Plans and Policy, Headquarters Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. Two little boys. Tell me about seeing those. Uh... Well, I had not. one of them was two years old then, our youngest, uh, and, and he'd been, he was born right after, while I was gone. He was already two years old. Uh, the other one was then uh, four, or five, five. They're two good-looking little boys. I was mighty happy to see them. Almost, we became friends immediately. Almost like starting over again as Papa was. Mm -hmm. It was all yeah. very exciting. Yeah. Very. 
So really, you people were you know, sort of like in a whirlwind in your career, when it, from one big event to the next event to the next event, and you really didn't know for sure where it was all leading at that time, did you? Yeah, things happened pretty fast those first few years. Uh, we got to Washington then to headquarters of the Marine Corps. That was a more or less stable existence uh, for just a few years. I was, uh, as I said, I was exec of the Plans and Policies Division, a G3 section. Uh, I was there for three years, then I went to Quantico to go to the Command Staff College as a student. Uh, while there, the Korean War started, but I stayed on there for about a, a year as uh, in the newly formed uh, Marine um, Research and Development Center. Did that Marine Corps, uh, I mean, did that Korean War come as a surprise to you, or were you anticipating some trouble over there again? It came as a surprise. Mm -hmm. We didn't know the trouble was building up. Uh, well, we knew to some extent the trouble was building up, but we didn't, uh, we didn't really foresee that the North Koreans were going to invade South Korea, as in fact they did, and that started the war. Uh, nor did we foresee that the uh, president would, order the, would get UN sanction and order U.S. and other forces, other countries, UN countries, into Korea. Uh, the Marine Corps had been reduced at that point to some 60-odd thousand officers and men from our wartime size of 600,000. Um, Marines were ordered to send a brigade to Pusan. Uh, the entire 1st Marine Division was put together to form one brigade, one infantry regiment, one artillery battalion, and related forces went off to Pusan. And then the Marines were ordered to form the remainder of the division to land at uh, the main landing there in, uh, at the port, uh, and the great amphibious wheel around that MacArthur ordered. Uh, I was at, you know, still at Quantico at that time. Later on, I was ordered to Camp Pendleton where we were for a few months. I was then the commanding officer to be the commanding officer of the 12th Marine Artillery Regiment. Uh, after we formed, and had some training done. Then we were ordered to Japan for eventual move into Korea, uh, but with the 3rd Marine Division. But uh, before uh, we were ordered in, that war came to an end. So my regiment and I never actually got into combat in Korea. Mrs. Chapman, but I went to Korea a number of times. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Chapman, you must have had visions of, this, uh, of all the horrors that happened in World War II. You must have had visions of all this reoccurring again. Yes, it was terrible just sitting there not knowing. And when he went to Japan, I expected him to go any day into Korea. It was a very trying time. General, for the first time, I, I think I'm correct, for the first time the Marines were really asked, in the, in, the, in the military was really asked to fight a limited war with your hands tied to some extent about going out and winning. What was, mm -hmm. what was the reaction in the officer corps to this type of approach to warfare? <laughs> well, you might expect the Marines were opposed to it. The Marine idea is to is to advance wherever you have to and seize the high ground and hold it and uh, defeat, defeat the enemy. Well, of course, we, uh, we started for the Yalu uh, River, which is the river that divides North Korea from China, and uh, halfway up the frozen chosen, uh, the Chinese attacked. As all students of history know, the Marines then had to return back uh, it was fight a terrible action to get back to the port of Wonsan and re-embarked and came on around and went back into Korea from the other side and then um, fought along the demilitarized zone where the war had originally started uh, for the remainder of the war. Uh, just a uh, holding action along that line. The North Koreans eventually agreed, decided that they'd done all they could do and they stopped fighting too and so that war ended and we were right back where we started. Hmm. Just one more question on Korea. The, Douglas MacArthur was the overall commander there, mm -hmm. and there was some controversy about how he handled that, and the president relieved him, of course. What was your opinion of General MacArthur, and did that surprise you when the Chinese came into the war? <clears throat> the Marine opinion of MacArthur during World War II was very poor, uh, as it was among many of the soldiers, too. You know, he's called Dugout Doug and many other epithets. Uh, which were, in fact, untrue. He was an incredibly brave man. Uh, but we didn't know that. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a somewhat low opinion of him that stemmed really from Bataan and uh, Corregidor. 
and the Marines that were involved there. But in the Korean War, when he ordered the uh, 1st Marine Brigade into Pusan, and then later he ordered the landing that ended, really ended the Chinese invasion up at the main city and port, uh, and he did that, uh, it was an incredible chance to take. He said that he wanted to make that landing, but he would only make it if he could get a Marine division to do it. And so, naturally, the Marine opinion of MacArthur <laughs> went way up at the top, and it's continued so ever since. Well, your career moved on. You received more promotions. Yes, I went from the 12th Marine Regiment, from Regimental Commander, I went to the CO of Marine Barracks at Yokosuka, Japan. We were there for two years. Emily was there with our two boys. We lived in Japan for two years. I was the CO of the Marines at the Navy uh, base at uh, uh, Yokosuka. What did, what did you think about serving in Japan? Did, what kind of a attitudes did the Japanese have? Did you ever see the we Japanese were, rearming themselves yes, again? Yes, well, no. I was prepared to dislike them heartily, but I got my mind changed. When you get down with just the ordinary Japanese people, the peasants, the farmers, the shopkeepers, the workers of all kinds, you find out they're just about like we are, you know. <laughs> There's nothing evil about them. They're just about like people everywhere. So and in that. fact, we became very well. I lived in Japan for three years. You see, one year with the 12th Marine Regiment and two years down to Marine Barracks at Yokosuka. I got the for great fondness and respect for the Japanese people. Do you think they ought to rearm today, carry their share of them? Oh, yes, I do. I think they ought to. The Constitution that MacArthur wrote for them, of course, prohibits it, but they could change that Constitution and, uh, and, uh, get, and, and uh, acquire, train and acquire a more, more of an offensive force. All they have are, are self-defense forces, as they're called, and they, are, they only take a very tiny percentage of their gross national product, their budget, so that I think they should do more. Were you in Japan also? Yes, for two years. And our boys learned to speak Japanese. And we had several little Japanese maids. They were very good cooks. And I took Japanese flower arranging. I enjoyed it. So it was a good experience all the way around mm -hmm. then. Mm -hmm. Well, another promotion came along. Before long, you were a general. And well, yes, I went from there to the be command officer of the Marine Barracks in Washington, the main Marine Corps uh, base in Washington. That's where many people have had the opportunity to go to the evening parades, the formal evening parades that the Marines put on there every Friday night. I was a command officer there for two years. In fact, I'm the originator of the evening parade. Are you the, sure enough? The uh, nighttime parade. That still goes on today? Oh, yes. Every Friday night. It's open to the public. It's always completely sold out, 3,000 or more spectators. And it's a beautiful military spectacle. It really is. Uh, at the end of that time, I was promoted to Brigadier General and went to Camp Lejeune, North Carolina to be the Commanding General of the Fleet of the Force Troops of the Fleet and Marine Force Atlantic, which is an organization of some 20-odd different units that support the division and the wing. There's artillery, tanks, amphibious and tractors, service, supply, communications, force reconnaissance, a number of other small and large units. Well, when you got your next promotion, would that be, what, Major General? Yes, I was CG, and we lived at Camp Lejeune for three years. It did, was a good time. Did you think that you might possibly become the Commandant then? You were no, moving no, on up? No, no, I never thought about that. Oh, but I thought he was. <laughs> no, <but> she may <laughs> have thought so. <laughs> but I was, at the end of that three years, as a Commanding General, I was promoted to Major General and ordered to uh, Headquarters Marine Corps, where I became the G-4 who's the log logistical staff officer for the Marine Corps. And I was G4 for two years. Um, and uh, at the end of that time, I was the new commandant, General Green, was selected, and he chose me to be his chief of staff. So I was promoted to three-star general, lieutenant general, and I was General Green's chief of staff for his entire four years as commandant. Well, except the last six months when I was made the assistant commandant for six months. Well, that suddenly, you were really getting up now where you were associating with prominent people, and I know that, that you had, the two of you have been a great team all through his career. 
you had to really start entertaining now, didn't you? And, and yes, uh, uh, we, uh, quite a burden on you. Could you talk about that a little we bit? We had several presidents come down to the evening parades, and we would have a garden party first. And President Johnson came down to a parade, and then as he was leaving, we went back through the house, and he fell down the front stairs, and they thought he'd been shot. <laughs> But he just had on some new shoes and slipped. <laughs> what President the, Johnson's uh, uh, son, uh, son in law to be was a captain at the Marine Barracks at that time, and he had met through Emily's auspices uh, Linda, Bird, Linda Bird Johnson, the oldest yeah. Johnson girl. And they fell in love and were married in the White House, and we attended the wedding. Mm -hmm. And Chuck Robb. Charles S. Robb, called Chuck Robb, is now the governor of Virginia. <laughs> Dr. Womack's rejoined us, and, and he's been to Washington quite a few times, so uh, I, I noticed that he had a chance to mingle with President Eisenhower one time, and he had a little story on that, but anyway. I wonder, you, when I walked in, you were saying you were chief of staff. Mm -hmm. What is a chief of staff? What does a chief of staff do? Well, the chief of staff is the head of the staff. Uh, the staff at headquarters of the Marine Corps consists of the four executive staff sections, G1, 2, 3, and 4. That's personnel, intelligence, operations and training, and logistics and supply, the latter being G4. And then numerous special staff sections of all kinds, communications, uh, um, computers, uh, and a dozen others. Well, the chief of staff sits on top of that staff. And he's, he has to coordinate the actions of the entire staff. That's his job. He coordinates, supervises, approves, disapproves, moves or doesn't move uh, the paperwork, mm -hmm. of which there's a tremendous flood. Mm -hmm. Everybody gets a big break in life, and, and, and you worked your way up. But somewhere along the line, you must have been in the right place at the right time to get that last push toward being commandant. Well, yes, of course. That's true. I was there as a Major General G4 and working for General Green, who was then the Chief of Staff, you see. He was my Chief of Staff. And so when he got selected for Commandant, he chose me to be his Chief of Staff. So naturally, obviously, it was, I was fortunate to be there at that time and to be in his good graces. <laughs> Johnson selected you then as the Commandant? Yes. Uh, President Johnson selected me to be the 24th Commandant. I was nominated in by him in December of 63 and, uh, and approved by the Senate and sworn in on the 1st of January of 60. Wait a minute, I'm 68. four years old. Yeah. 1st of January of 68. Yeah, 68. Well, tell me your impressions of the President. I'm sure you have very favorable ones because uh, he selected you, but give me a some kind of analysis of what you thought of him and working with the military and working with people. I liked him a lot. I thought he was a good commander in chief. Uh, he was decisive. I didn't always agree with his decisions, but he definitely made decisions. When, when it was time to make a decision, he made it and he stuck behind it. Uh, he was good, I thought. I thought he was an excellent commander in chief. I said I didn't, disagree, I didn't agree with some of the decisions, uh, in particular the uh, the idea of, uh, of a build-up in the Vietnam War, that if we kept increasing the pressure, eventually the North Vietnamese would cave in. They never did. That incrementing approach, which was the object of what the Joint Chiefs recommended, uh, just didn't work, and the military never thought it would work. What and did it did. the Joint Chiefs recommend? No, the Joint Chiefs recommended an all-out invasion, bombing, closing the port, and bringing the war, war to an end in a matter of weeks, mm -hmm. which I'm sure we could have done. Uh, the great question would have been, of course, would the Chinese come again, come in as they had in Korea? Uh, I never thought they would, but of course, MacArthur didn't think they'd come in in Korea either, and he so told the president, and he turned out to be wrong. So, who knows, history never reveals its alternatives. Mm -hmm. We'll never know what would have happened well, as a Marine, if we'd have done what the Joint Chiefs recommended. Well, as Marine Corps Commandant, then you were a member of the Joint Chief of Staff, mm -hmm. and so you worked with the heads of the Navy and the Army and yes. so forth. Tell me a little bit about how that worked. Well, the Joint Chiefs are a corporate body set up by law, consisting of the Chief of Naval Operations, who was a dear friend, Admiral Tom Moore, 
the uh, Chief of Staff of the Army, who at that point was General Westmoreland, who, by the way, had been at Fort Sill when him and I went to Fort Sill in 1937, uh, and I'd known him since that time, uh, and the Chief of Staff of the Air Force, and then the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs was General, an Army General named Wheeler. Nickname was Bus, Bus Wheeler. It was a, it was a good group, very intelligent, experienced, hard-nosed group of service chiefs who got together very well on the, on the Joint Chiefs, were unanimous in almost all of their opinions, worked very well together in uh, supporting and fighting the war. Did you meet separately or did you meet with the President uh, or both ways? Oh, both. Both yeah, ways. the Chiefs met regularly, <coughs> scheduled meetings every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday afternoons at 1 o'clock. Those were the schedules. There were many special meetings uh, for particular emergencies. Uh, and then there were uh, quite a number of meetings at the White House with the President. The Chiefs, of course, are directly under the Secretary of Defense under the public law of 1947. Uh, and uh, the Secretary of Defense, of course, in turn directly under the President. But by law, the Chiefs are the principal military advisors to the President and the Secretary of Defense. So whenever there was uh, some important question, we'd meet with the President in the White House. First, of course, with President Johnson, then with President Nixon, and then later with President Ford. And of course, it's still going on to this day. Well, you, well, you came along at a time when the Marine Corps Commandant had to fight a war. All of a sudden, uh, you were at the top of military power, the most powerful nation in the world, and you were dealing with the major leaders of the world. Did you ever have a minute or two to pause and think, Great goodness, how did I get to this point? In, uh... Well, yes, I did occasionally. I didn't have much time for self-meditation, though. Both uh, of our sons were in the war in Vietnam. They were captains in the Marine Corps. And first one boy would go over and come back, and then the second boy would go over. My husband went over every two or three months. It was a very trying time. And our younger son was wounded at Quezon. Not seriously, but he didn't come. He didn't evacuate, so, but he was wounded. So for the third time, then you were going through the trauma of yes, war again as a mother. Yes, and, it really and, was. And a wife. Yeah, one, uh, one boy, our oldest boy, made did three tours in Vietnam during the war. The other one did two tours and was wounded once. And uh, we had one or the other of them there all the time, and sometimes both of them. Mm -hmm. It was yeah. terrible. Mm -hmm. Bob, that war was a war on television, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, first one. Uh, <clears throat> when you went to Vietnam, uh, were you ever able to see your son while you were there? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I was. <clears throat> but I'd go to where he was. I yeah. wouldn't, uh, wouldn't arrange for him to come in to see me. Did you ever have any uh, meetings or dealings with Henry Kissinger? Oh, yes. Was he? Frequently. Mm -hmm. I, I, that is, as, the, as one of the chiefs. Yeah. I did. Mm -hmm. Did you find him a very clear thinker? He is a clear thinker. Yeah. thinker. He's very intelligent, very articulate, has an amazing command of the English language, considering it's not his native language. And if you stick with him long enough, you'll eventually get to the verb <laughs> at the end of the sentence. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell me about some more uh, people up at that level. You had to, who was the Secretary of, of Defense at that time? Uh, McNamara. Uh, and then later on, uh, three others, uh, but McNamara principally. Well, what about your impressions of McNamara? Again, very intelligent, very much of a skilled and veteran uh, manager, but not a good leader of armed forces in a time of war. Mm -hmm. Not good at all. And his uh, proposal to increment the war, that was the McNamara strategy. The, gradual in gradualization, the gradual increase of force until the North Vietnamese yelled a calf rope, which they never did, uh, was unsuccessful. Well, there was so much going on in this country just as the time that you became commandant. We had the election of 1968. Tell me about mm -hmm. a Marine officer and political views. How, how did you deal with that? Well, I was, I'm a member of the old school military. We had, had no connection with politics <laughs> in the old school. We didn't even vote. It was one of the traditions of the service, of the career professional officers, 
uh, to have no political connections, whatever, and not even to vote. Mm -hmm. And I didn't. I didn't. But my first time I voted in a national election was after the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. uh, about the time I retired. Mm -hmm. So we had no connection, no involvement with politics at all. And um, there w it would have been very bad. It would have been unthinkable for one of the military chiefs in any way to take part in the political campaign. And we never did. We never have, and I'm sure the military never will. Mm -hmm. A lot of social unrest in the country, demonstrations, uh, outright opposition to the war. How did that affect you trying to train men, fight the war, and, and keep up the standards of the Corps? Uh, not very much. That didn't, didn't affect it very much. Um, the Marines uh, continued to get the necessary number of recruits, mostly volunteers, uh, train them in the same old way. We were very careful to train each Marine thoroughly in his combat duties before we sent him to Vietnam. So all the Marine replacements arriving in Vietnam were thoroughly trained in for that type of war before they got there. Uh, it was a lengthy training process. It was about six months. If, you know, about eight week, ten weeks of recruit training and then several, a good many weeks of specialized training for Vietnam. And it was a huge training effort in that uh, it was a one-year tour of duty in Vietnam, so the entire Marine force in Vietnam, which was 100,000 Marines at the peak of the war, out of a total Marine strength of 300,000, uh, it was just a never-ending major training process. Uh, the Marine Corps at that point could be divided into three parts. One-third was in Vietnam, one-third was going to Vietnam, and one-third just was coming back from <laughs> Vietnam and getting discharged. It was a big effort. It was a but the Marines, did, we did not lower the Marine standards in any way throughout the war. That's one of the things you're proud of, isn't it, as a commandant at that time, that you were able to keep up the... Yes, uh, yes, that was one. And, of course, that was a Marine tradition. That's what the way, way we'd done it in all our previous wars. Uh, we didn't change anything in the Vietnam War. Uh, toward the end of the war, as we were pulling out of Vietnam, and I was still commandant, we again went through the trauma of uh, shrinking down in size, voluntarily, by the way, of cleaning house, straightening up, squaring away, and returning to our very high professional standards, a very tight, elite, professional, relatively small Marine Corps. As you probably will remember, some of the other services went, went for beer in the barracks and long hair and other loosening ups of discipline. Uh, but the Marine Corps went exactly the other way. A lot of strain mm -hmm. on a person in, the, in that type of command. Could you see the strain on your husband and tell the everyday difference? From no, he enjoyed it thoroughly. <laughs> <laughs> so that would be yeah, one, really of the, one of the keys to success then is to enjoy yes, what you're doing. Yes. Now, what did is your you, attitude toward uh, the volunteer, all volunteer armed forces? You think it'll well, work? Yeah, at the time, I was opposed to it, and I testified against it, not on behalf of the Marine Corps. I was convinced then, and still, and that's proved by experience, that the Marine, or Marines always have been able to get a sufficient number of high-quality volunteers without use of the draft. And that's true today. Uh, but I thought it was a bad thing, would be a bad thing, uh, for, the, uh, for the Army particularly, and that it would cost a lot of unnecessary money. And that's exactly what's happened. The Army, until recent uh, year or two, has had a very difficult time uh, recruiting in sufficient quality soldiers for the Army. Today they're doing very well, however, I'm proud to say. And on the money side, the, the, the personnel costs of the Department of Defense budget prior to the all-volunteer force were about 28 or 30 percent of the total budget. Today, with the all-volunteer force, they're about 68 percent, the personnel cost. Mm -hmm. So the personnel costs are two-thirds of the budget, and it's directly, directly the result of the all-volunteer force and the pay scales that have to be paid for an all-volunteer force. So it's, it's the major part of the reason why defense costs so much today. Mm -hmm. well, what uh, kind of a screening program do you have uh, did, does the Marine Corps have a young man, say, just out of high school or uh, just out of some school, 
wants to become a Marine, what kind of qualifications do you ask well, him? Well, today to he has to be a high school graduate. That's number one. Uh, he has to be able to pass the physical exam, which is pretty rigorous. Um, he has to be able to pass a, uh, an exam and a research into his past. Has he ever had a drug conviction or, a, or a, any kind of, uh, of involvement with the law? Has to have a clean record. And above all, however, he's got to want to be a Marine. He's got to practically demand to be allowed to join the Marine Corps. And the Marine Corps takes only volunteers and only a few good men. Uh, the uh, waiting list of recruits at the Marine recruiting stations far exceeds the quota that's assigned to each recruiting station. Is the, so the Marines can be pretty cheap <coughs> and are. Excuse me. Is the Marine Corps finding that the high school graduate of, of today is capable of doing the, meeting the demands of the Corps? We hear yes. so much criticism mm -hmm. of education, and I just wondered what the Marine Corps' attitude toward it would be. Well, the Marines, are, as I've just said, are pretty selective. Yeah. But the high school graduate, by and large, is a, he, he's, a, he's a good kid. Uh, he, he, he demonstrates one thing that makes him a good soldier, a Marine, or sailor, or airman, and that is perseverance. He stuck it out. He got to the end and got his diploma. Perhaps the quality of the education he got and again, isn't, isn't all we would like, but he demonstrated he can stick it out. He can get to the end. He's got perseverance, and that's important. Uh, interestingly, another thing a high school graduate indicates is that he probably did not come from a broken family. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, some, I forget the exact figures, but 90-odd percent of the of high school graduates are from families that have stayed together. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Chapman, earlier in part one, we talked about the home where you spend your time in Bedford County. And, and uh, at this time, uh, I'd like for us to show a film clip that we took down there. We took a film crew to your home a week ago and visited down there. And so at this time, we'll show that film. Yeah, well, we're in the yard of the old Singleton place at Fairfield in Bedford County. It's quite old. The house behind me on, the, uh, on my right, this port, was built about 1790 as a, a tavern on the trace from Nashville to Chattanooga. The front part of the house was built about 1860 as an addition by my great-grandfather. The uh, cast of characters with me here are first my wife, Emily, Thank and my daughter-in-law, Gail Chapman. <laughs> Come closer, and then you'll get hooked up. And my granddaughter, Danielle Chapman. Say something, Danielle. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> and her dear friend, Sarah Bockweg. We live here every summer for uh, two or three months and enjoy the beautiful scenery in Middle Tennessee. We enjoy going in our own little swimming pool down there in the river, the garrison, two or three times a day. We eat lots of good things that are raised here in the countryside. And we, we remember at times and reflect on the history of this old place. It was bought by my great grandfather who came from Murfreesboro. Uh, he was a doctor, got his medical training at Vanderbilt, set up in practice here in, this, in the rear house married a girl from two miles up the road. Her name was Elizabeth Scott. Uh, raised a large family here, one of whom was my grandfather, Robert Lipscomb Singleton, who uh, at the age of 17 uh, joined the 17th Tennessee and fought with that regiment for a good part of the war, Civil War. Uh, at the Battle of Stones River, he was in the, uh, one of the charges and was hit by a mini ball, lost his uh, right leg, or it was later amputated, badly imaged, uh, uh, injured and then later amputated. Uh, my great grandmother hitched up her buggy from this house and rode over to the battlefield and found him and brought him back. He recuperated here in this house and then having given his parole uh, to the uh, Union Army, 
who uh, was in possession of the battlefield at the conclusion of the battle, he turned himself back in as a prisoner and spent the rest of the war in two different uh, prison camps up north. At the end of the war, he came back here. Uh, he was destitute, as were all the families in this area at that time, after the end of the war. Uh, he had the farm, which is just uh, south of us here. It was the Singleton farm that uh, my great-grandfather had bought in 1820. And uh, he was able to do a little farming, but having only one leg, he couldn't do much. So he eventually ran for public office and was elected clerk of the county court of Bedford County in uh, Shelbyville and moved to Shelbyville, was married there. My mother was born there. Uh, and he served as clerk of the county court for, oh, 25 or 30 years, James eventually retired and moved back here. Meanwhile, my mother and father uh, were married. My father was a divinity student at Vanderbilt, met her at Mont Eagle at one of the church conventions there. Re uh, they were married right here in this old house in the front parlor uh, and moved to Florida where he had his first church. Uh, we came up here every summer for as long as I can remember. Uh, first, on the first occasion when I was about three and we lived here for about five years during and after the World War I. Uh, subsequent to that time, we moved back to Florida and we came up here, as I said, and spent every summer here for all the time I was going to grammar school and high school and college. So I partly grew up right here. When I graduated from college, I joined the Marine Corps and spent some 37 years in the Marine Corps. But that's another story. We're here today to talk about this old house and the people that are here. Emily, would you like to add anything to what yes, I've added? Yes, ever since we've been married, we've come here every summer for a week, two weeks, sometimes a month. We'd bring our boys here. and They loved swimming in the river and fishing on the banks down there. It's a lovely place to visit. Well, we're now standing uh, by one of the two detached structures in the, at the old Singleton place. Uh, the other is the barn, which is over in that direction. This building was the original kitchen. The original part of this building was the kitchen for the old house back in the 19th century. It was later converted into uh, sleeping quarters, and after the later than that, it was converted into a little uh, bungalow, a residence. I'm James and Ella Driver, who are natives of Coffee and Bedford counties, have lived here for a good many years. Ella, how long have you lived here? Soon be 30 years. <laughs> Not 28. No, 30. Yeah. Dell Anderson. <laughs> <laughs> <There you are. laughs> well, all right. How does that last? Who's 30 now? 30 years. We will be December, the first day of this December, we'll be here 30 years. 30 years. <laughs> All right, 30 years. Well, it's a very comfortable, very nice little bungalow. Uh, it's uh, been here, the original part of it has been here almost as long as the original house over there. It's quite old. We're in the old part of this house, and this bedroom furniture was a wedding present to my husband's grandmother. It was bought in New Orleans and came up the river to Memphis and then came overland. The bed is made out of burl walnut and rosewood and uh, has three pieces, a wardrobe and a dresser and a washstand. And it's been here in this house ever since it was bought. This is the tavern common room in the original tavern, which was built about 1790. This was the room where the guests gathered, where they entered when they first arrived. Uh, next door, right here, it was the tavern dining room, which we'll come to in a moment. The, uh, the wainscoting, the fireplace, the uh, trim around the top, and the uh, ceiling are all original. Fireplace is original. Dates to about 1790. The flooring is not, but the original flooring is underneath this floor that you see here. Over in that corner was the tavern bar. This was the tavern front door there. Uh, this led out to two guest rooms, one on each side, and two up above. And uh, two rooms doesn't sound like many these days, but in those days, they just lay down on the floor side by side and spent the night. 
slept all night long. So 18 or 20 people could be accommodated here for one evening. Mm -hmm. The little room that's now the kitchen was a, was a guest room. It was for a family or for a couple. The little one across the way was also a small room for a special guest, a husband and wife. Top side were the male travelers who, as I said, just lay down side by side and slept soundly all night long mm -hmm. on the floor. Oh, by the way, I should say that the oldest piece in the house is this uh, safe. It comes from Wilmington, North Carolina, and was brought here to Bedford County about 1805 with my great-great-grandfather. The oak dining room furniture, the table, the chairs, the sideboard, the china press, and that table are all originals from uh, Shelbyville. Victorian era. They were uh, the furniture of my grandmother and grandmother, grandfather that they brought here when they returned to Fairfield after he retired as clerk of the county court of Bedford County. The Victrola in the corner is an original uh, Edison photograph. This was the old tavern's dining room. And they stayed here for dinner, of course, and they usually eat here. <laughs> and this was a letter sent to my great-great-grandfather from Nashville on August the 2nd, um, 1868. This is what it says. Robert L. Singleton, Singleton World Trace, Tennessee. Dear Sir, come to Nashville on the 7th of August to have your artificial leg fitted. Be punctual to time as all is ready for fitting. Respectfully, James W. Morton. And it was sent to Mrs. Is this, oh, that's for this letter. Sarah, I'll tell you about that letter. This is a letter from her relative. And it was a letter f from Fort Delaware by Robert L. Singleton when a prisoner of war and very ill. He was the father of Mrs. Clare's chaplain, 1310, Brian Moore. Orlando. Orlando. And this was sent on August 11th in 1864 to Mrs. E.S. Singleton. His mother. His mother. General, you were speaking about the importance, are you in, uh, implying the importance of Marines coming from unbroken homes. Would you mm -hmm. like to elaborate on that just a little bit? Well, in this way, by noting that the overwhelming majority of Marines that get in trouble go over, go over the hill or overstay their leave or get in any other kind of difficulty, the overwhelming majority come from broken families. It's a commentary on our society today. There are so many broken families now, and the impact that, that, that the broken family has on the child, the impact on the children, there's the children that suffer from the broken family. And you see that in the Marine Corps statistics. Mm -hmm. Well, the problems that we have in society drift over into all our institutions, and in, in mm -hmm. Vietnam, we start having a, a drug problem with some troops. How did the Marine Corps face up to that? Well, the Marine Corps was touched by it in Vietnam and then later on back in the States. Uh, the Marines have, uh, have launched a very vigorous and demanding anti-drug program so that today, and this is 1985, there's very little or no drug problem in the Marine Corps. But it's been a long, hard road, it's been a tough road. I think the Marines, the, the Marine <laughs> commandants that have followed me have done a really remarkable job in rooting, in largely rooting out the drug problem in the Marine Corps. But it's certainly not rooted out in our society, however. Yeah. Of course, the Marines have a, have a pretty simple solution when they find a Marine that's uh, in, indulging. They just throw him out of the Marine Corps <laughs> and return him to society where he came from. 
That what cleanses the Marine Corps, but it, of course it doesn't help society very much. Mm -hmm. Reflecting back on the war again, let's talk a little bit more about the impact of television on the war and, and how you had to deal with that. We said in World War II well, things were censored. Yeah, of course, there was no censorship in uh, Vietnam. Uh, that was rooted in the idea that we were invited there by a friendly country, South Vietnam, Republic of Vietnam, which in turn did not elect to uh, install censorship on its forces, and therefore we really couldn't on ours. Uh, the result of that was that there was a complete media coverage of everything that happened in the war, or most things that happened in the war, and some of it was pretty, pretty bad. It didn't look real good on the, at the evening news hour in the American homes every night during the war. Media, of course, elected, as you would expect them, to uh, show the worst scenes. Uh, they seldom, if ever, showed the good things, so that there was a distorted view of the war was produced. For instance, the, uh, that uh, one terrible episode where the Army lieutenant was eventually court-martialed. Cali. Yeah. That was one episode, one bad episode among tens of thousands of good episodes in which the Marines, as I know personally, uh, would enter a village, would protect, uh, support, defend, uh, nurture, feed, clothe uh, the inhabitants of the village, and would establish defensive lines around the village in which the villagers joined them for the, f for the future protection of the village. So there were thousands and thousands of episodes like that, one like the Cali episode but it was the latter that was shown on the television. It wasn't the good ones. Hmm. You had and of course, that's what made the uh, veterans of Vietnam so unhappy with the medium, was the distortion of the coverage, the one-sidedness of the coverage. Hmm. You had to deal with a controversial president, President Nixon. We talked about mm -hmm. President Johnson earlier. Give me your views and reactions on President Nixon. Well, at the time, I was a chief of service and a member of the Joint Chiefs, of course. He, was, uh, he wasn't involved in that the Watergate controversy, that came later. I, there again, I thought he was an excellent commander-in-chief. He certainly had a, a wonderful knowledge and understanding of the, of the world and all the countries in it. He knew when something happened in Madagascar, it had an impact in Paris. Uh, he knew that. He did it from, knew it from his years of experience. He was, and he was very able um, and very understanding of the military and military strategy and tactics, both at sea and in, on land and in the air. I thought he was an excellent commander-in-chief. The Watergate controversy came later after I retired from the Marine Corps, and uh, at, 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 during the time of the controversy, he appointed me Commissioner of Immigration and Naturalization, President Nixon did. And I was then in that capacity for about four years after leaving the Marine Corps and President Nixon appointed me. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Chapman, you, you got to work with some first ladies. Could you give us your comments on what you saw there? Yes, I knew Mrs. Johnson, Mrs. Nixon, Mrs. Cavendish, and Mrs. Ford, and they were all very gracious ladies. I think they all complimented their husbands. Mm -hmm. But you had to do a lot of entertaining again, didn't you? Oh, yes, I, I did, but I had a lot of help. The, the immigration problem uh, seems to be with us and seems to be almost out of control. Do you have any ideas on uh, what the United States could do to control its southern borders with Mexico? Well, yes, it's, it's nothing difficult about the solution. It just takes uh, some courage on the part of our legislators. Uh, we need a law that will make it illegal to hire an illegal alien because it surprises most people that it's illegal for the alien to be here, and it's illegal, illegal for him to work, but it's perfectly legal to hire him. Mm -hmm. And, of course, a great many American employers do. We need a law that would prohibit that. And then we need to beef up the immigration service, the border guards and the inspectors at the ports of entry, so they, so they have enough and force to cope with the floods that are coming in, not only over the border at night, surreptitiously, but also through the ports of entry. See, they come through the ports as, uh, as tourists with fake passports or with good passports, temporary visas, 
come into this country and then they just never leave, that's all. He's just here as a tourist, then stays here for 20, 30 years. Or they come in as businessmen or students. Perhaps you have some alien students at Middle Tennessee State. I don't quite know. a few. Yeah. Quite a few. Well, yeah. I bet you if you ran statistics on them, you'd find that about half of them would never go home. <laughs> that was the statistics that, uh, although they are here on temporary student visas, and they, when they finish their education, they're supposed to go back home and benefit the country that they came from. But about half or more never do. General, we're down to our last few minutes, and I'd like for you to come in on three things as we finish mm -hmm. up. I'd like for you to come in on leadership. I'd like for you to comment on your fondest memories of the Corps, and I'd like for you to comment on about the resurgence of patriotism we have in the country today. Well, it's easy to comment on those three things. Uh, of course, leadership is the, is the name of the game. It's the supreme quality that's required in the military, and particularly in the Marine Corps. Uh, leadership in the Marine Corps means follow me, <laughs> means setting the example. It means for the platoon leader to be out in front of his platoon leading them mm -hmm. and all the way up the line. And the Marines do that. They practice that. Another part of Marine leadership is uh, caring for the troops. Uh, the relationship as laid down in the Marine Corps manual between a Marine leader and his men is one of uh, teacher and scholar, even father and son. And that's the way the Marine lieutenant thinks of his platoon and the Marine captain thinks of his company. He thinks of the of those Marines as being his sons. Mm -hmm. And he takes care of them and leads them in that kind, with that sort of frame of mind and philosophy. Patriotism, uh, I don't know that it ever disappeared really, although it was perhaps a little diminished among certain people, but in the great body of American citizens, I don't think there's ever been any diminution of patriotism. Uh, it didn't make the front pages of the newspapers there for quite a while, but I think it's been there all the time. It always will be. In your fondest memories of the Corps? The Marines. <laughs> Undoubtedly, the Marines and their wives, their helpers. <laughs> well, General, it, it's people like you and Mrs. Chapman who have given your entire lives to your country. You served your country. You're the type of people we think have made our nation great, and, and we think the nation owes a, a debt of gratitude to you, and we wish you well in retirement, and we appreciate you being on the show. This concludes part two of our discussion with General and Mrs. Leonard Chapman. Thank you. And thanks to you. Thank you.